start, my name is Melissa Rex. I'm with FWC's Division of Marine Fisheries Management. I'm out of the Tallahassee office. Um, and my staff works on regulations for state waters and fisheries that don't um, have a heavy interaction with the councils, the federal councils, um, you might hear about the food mission stuff. Um, we want to hear from everybody. FWC is holding these workshops so that we can get feedback from y'all about what's important to you, what your values are relative to the shore based shark fishery, um, and just generally hear from y'all about what you think the agency ought to be doing for you. So why are we here? Um, we're here to talk about the shore based shark fishing fishery. Um, this is a high interest topic, has been for quite a few years. I will say that interest in the topic has picked up a lot in the last couple of years. And in April of this year, we took a um, presentation to our commissioners at their commission meeting in April, talked about a whole lot of things related to sharks, uh, but specifically the shore-based shark fishing fishery. And they asked us to come talk to you all. They asked us to go back out to the public get some input, get some feedback on this fishery, and then bring that back to them for their consideration. So that's why we're doing these workshops. Uh, we'll be gathering the input, and then we'll be potentially putting together for some management options for our commissioners to consider, and we'll take that back to our commission um, at a future meeting for them to direct us how they would like us to move forward on this issue. So just a little bit of an outline. I'm going to give a presentation, then we'll have a questions and answer session. When we get to the question and answer sessions, we're going to have some microphones. Um, I didn't say it earlier, but you might have noticed that there's a lot of cameras in the room. Um, so the Florida Channel is recording this, um, and it will be available on the web. Uh, the agency also is recording these for our purposes, so um, we are recording the meeting, and when we get to the questions and answers and the public feedback, uh, we'll pass around a mic and, and ask that you use them so that that can be captured by the Florida Channel um, for their online purposes. Um, after questions and answers, we'll move into formal public comment, and then we'll wrap up at the end of the presentation so that, with some next steps so you know what to expect, where, where the agency is going to go after we finish these public workshops. Um, in addition to being here tonight, there's other ways that you can comment on this topic or anything else related to marine fisheries management. Um, we've got the blue cards over there, like I said. If you have comments on another fishery and you want to fill them out, that's fine. Uh, but we also have an online commenting portal. It's myfwc.com slash saltwatercomments. Um, and there's various options for you to check about what you'd like to comment on that website, or you can just comment about anything. We've got an open commenting section as well. And then finally, our commission meetings. Our commission meets five times a year. Uh, we try to move the meetings around the state to give folks in different parts of the state an opportunity uh, to attend those meetings. They're not always convenient for folks. We understand that. They are during the day, during the business day. Um, but if you're able to go to a commission meeting when there's a topic on the agenda that's of interest to you, I would strongly encourage you to attend. It carries a lot of weight, what the public says, when our, to our commissioners. We are going to do everything we can to provide your feedback to our commissioners. We have a lot of different ways we can communicate that, that information to them. Um, but it resonates a lot if you're there talking to the commissioners in person. It's very meaningful to them that folks will take time out of their day and come and speak to the commissioners. So I would encourage you to come to a commission meeting if you're able. Um, and if you're not able, uh, if you have a like-minded friend who is able and have them go and, and speak to your issue from your perspective. It's uh, always encouraged. All right, so let's talk about sharks. So sharks continue to be overfished globally um, in, for some species, not all species, but we do have species of sharks that continue to be overfished, and we do have species that are continuing to decline globally. Um, however, there's been a lot of progress in recent years, and we're starting to see some species recover. We certainly have a lot of protections in place here in the U.S., uh, the U.S. Shark Finning Prohibition Act and, and regulations here in the state of Florida, but we're also seeing a lot of international treaties and other regulations in other nations that are really providing a lot more protection for sharks in recent years, and we are starting to see recovery of a lot of shark species. Um, and sustainable shark fisheries and shark fisheries management is increasing worldwide. We're seeing more, more and more sustainable shark fisheries internationally. Um, that's in part due to tighter regulations on fishing and tighter regulations on international trade. We're also seeing a growing appreciation for sharks as a part of the ecosystem and sharks as an, eco, uh, as an ecotourism opportunity. So good things happening worldwide with sharks. Uh, we have an even better story to tell here in the southeastern U.S. We do still have a few species that are experiencing overfishing here um, in the southeastern U.S., but in general, um, our shark fisheries are in a pretty good place now in the southeastern U.S. We did, re U.S., um, I'm sorry, NOAA Fisheries did recently review a series of applications to list shark species as endangered species under the Endangered Species Act, and most of them, for most of those species, um, NOAA found that they didn't warrant listing, uh, which is good news. That's great news that our sharks are not 
um, endangered or threatened. Um, and as of today, the oceanic white tip is the only species that is listed under the ESA in the waters off Florida, and that's listed as threatened. Um, and that is a species that does not interact, that's a species that occurs far offshore, it doesn't interact with shore-based shark fishery. Um, so the sharks that we're talking about in this fishery, none of them are ESA listed, um, and that is a good story to be able to tell. All right, so let's talk about Florida and our management of sharks here in the state of Florida. It has been important to Florida to be a leader in management of our shark fisheries, um, and we've had stricter regulations in place um, than the federal regulations and in adjacent states for a long time. Um, our commercial fishermen here in Florida, when they're fishing in state waters, are required to abide by the recreational regulations. Um, so we are very conservative with our shark fishing regulations. We also have 26 species of sharks for which all harvest is prohibited. That doesn't mean that FWC doesn't think that shark fisheries can be sustainable. We do think that our shark fisheries are sustainable. We just want to be really mindful. Um, we know that these species can be vulnerable, and so we're just being really careful about how we manage them. And um, for a variety of reasons, there's, we really feel like there's value in providing additional conservation for sharks in the waters immediately off Florida, which is part of the reason we have these stricter regulations. Uh, the picture that you see, the map that you see is um, all of this green is area that's considered essential fish habitat for the Great Hammerhead. You can see that that's pretty much all of our coastal waters. Almost all of our state waters are considered essential fish habitat, waters that are really important to some portion of the Great Hammerhead's life. And if I were to show you a series of maps for other species, you would see a similar trend. Um, we also know that here in Florida, we have sharks, particularly pregnant females sometimes, that are coming into known locations at known times of year, making them more susceptible to shark fishing um, than they would be out in federal waters where they're more dispersed. So that's some of the reasons that we have stricter regulations in state waters than there are in federal waters. Again, it doesn't mean that we don't think that some level of harvest is unsustainable. That's not what we're saying when we say a species is prohibited. We're just saying it warrants extra protection and we're providing extra conservation when those sharks occur in our state waters adjacent to shore. So shore-based shark fishing. Uh, we have been working on this issue for several years and we recently launched our shark smart fishing guidelines. Um, those guidelines are over on the table, I believe. Um, and if, if you participate in this fishery and you have feedback about those shark smart guidelines, we would love to hear that from you. So grab a copy of them. Um, I hope that they're over there. Uh, we will eventually be developing a brochure, so any feedback you have on those guidelines would be appreciated. We've also been meeting with tournament directors and meeting with municipalities, trying to dispel some of the myths of shark behavior and shark fishing. So those are some of the things that we've been doing the last few years with management of this fishery. Um, but there is interest now in exploring regulatory measures, and so that's why we're here tonight, is to talk about potential regulatory measures for this fishery. So a little bit more about shore-based shark fishing in general. I think everybody realizes likely that Florida's beaches are a popular fishing destination. Um, that goes for shark fishing as well as every other kind of fishing that might be, might be successful at the shore. Um, it's important to Florida to promote um, our beaches and, and have provide access for folks for, for shore-based fishing. And shore-based shark fishing has been popular for decades. This is not a new thing. Um, it is probably more high profile than it used to be, um, but it's been going on for a long time. And uh, a lot of the, most of the fishermen that we talk to that participate in this fishery are catch and release oriented. And many of them participate in research related tagging programs while they're out there fishing. Uh, the activity obviously can occur from beaches, bridges, piers, other structures adjacent to shore. And often occurs at night, but not always. One of the things that we've heard um, from folks that we've talked to here in the panhandle is that y'all's beaches are pretty empty in the wintertime, even during the day. And so some of our shore based shark fishermen will use the beaches during the day um, in the winter time when there's not a lot of folks at them. Now you get down into southeast Florida and in the winter time the beaches are packed. So there's differences in this fishery that occur regionally around the state um, based on the geography of the state and, and what else is going on on the beaches. Um, so lots of things that can happen around the state to influence how the fishery operates. Uh, we certainly have private anglers participating in this fishery. We also have shore-based fishing guides who are taking folks out and, and teaching them how to shore-based shark fish. Um, as part of their income. And then tournaments. Uh, the tournaments tend to draw a lot of attention. We hear a lot about the tournaments when they're up and running. Um, those tournaments can be regional, just a few, you know, just a local area, maybe a couple counties. They can also be statewide, they can be multi-state. We have a lot of our tournaments, uh, we have folks participating internationally. So you'll see postings on the, sh the, the tournament forums from Australia or Texas 
or Georgia or South Carolina. Uh, so that's an important thing to know when you're seeing things about the, the shore based shark fishing tournaments is that not everything that you're seeing is happening in Florida. Okay, so moving on to the public concerns that we've heard about this fishery. I would say that generally the concerns that we've heard from the public kind of fall into two categories. <laughs> And that is conflicts between the anglers and folks who are doing other things besides shore-based shark fishing um, and concerns about shark mortality. So if we talk about first about um, conflicts between anglers and other user groups um, on our beaches or other folks that have different perspectives about what our beaches should be used for, um, some of those concerns are related to anxiety, uh, that fishing draws sharks near to shore. And while there's no credible evidence that um, indicates that shore-based shark fishing leads to an increase in the number of bites, we certainly are sensitive to the fact that folks want to feel safe when they come to our Florida beaches. So it's important for us to keep that in mind, even though right now we don't believe um, that there's the shore-based fishery is leading to any increase in shark bites, we definitely want people to feel safe. Uh, we also hear concerns from folks that the tackle, the large tackle that's used in this fishery, um, is a safety concern for them, whether it's while it's being fished or if it gets left on the beaches. And then we've also heard a lot from anglers that say, you know, hey, look, we've been doing this for decades. They don't want to see a traditional fishery go away. Uh, so we're trying to make sure we're managing for, for all the folks who are affected by um, this fishery. And then the other thing that um, folks are concerned about is shark mortality. Um, this is a fairly small fishery. It's pretty high profile. Uh, a lot of pictures, a lot of social media associated with it. But with respect to how many people participate in this fishery and the amount of sharks that are targeted in this fishery relative to other fishing activities, it's really pretty small. We don't have any reason to believe that the shore-based shark fishery threatens the sustainability of shark populations. So that is not our concern. However, we have a lot of folks that are concerned um, that sharks are dying at a higher rate than they do, need to associated with this fishery. Um, we also have uh, heard misconceptions that the shark species that are targeted by this fishery are listed as endangered or threatened. I already told you that is not the case. Um, when we talk about threatened species, we're talking about the Endangered Species Act. Um, and as I said before, the oceanic white tip is the only one off Florida that, that is threatened. We don't have any that are listed as endangered. Um, and um, so that's, that's kind of a misconception that we're trying to dispel. But we do have a lot of concerns from both anglers and non-anglers about um, mishandling of sharks and the fact that it could lead to more release mortality than necessary. So that's certainly a concern that we hear. Um, anytime we have a catch and release fishery operating, um, if you're gonna release that fish, we all want it to have a best chance, its best chance of survival as possible. And so that's kind of a broad concern that, that's been shared by a lot of folks. And then of course, uh, we fully recognize that in the age of social media, um, that there's an, an increase in awareness of everything that happens in the public, and that certainly applies to shore shark fishing as well. So we recognize that um, the increase in media and social media leads to an increased perception that this, that this fishery is growing, whether it is or not. Okay, so where do we go from here? We have a variety of possible management actions we could take. I'm gonna go through some that we've identified um, as potential options for rulemaking. We could do one of these things, we could do none of these things, we could do a whole combination of these things. Um, so I'm gonna present those to you for you guys to give us feedback on. Um, these are options that we've heard, some of them we've developed, some of them we've developed in talking to either um, shore-based shark fishermen or shark conservationists. So the options that I'm going to present, we've already uh, worked with some folks to kind of get about ideas about how we might move forward, and now we're taking it out for broader public feedback. The overarching goal of anything that we might do, we really have two goals that we would like to accomplish if we're going to make, take any regulatory action. One would be to maximize the survival of those released sharks. If we're going to release them, let's do the, give them the best they, chance they have to survive. Um, and then also to minimize the various conflicts between our shark fishermen um, and not the non-shark fishing public, whether it's other anglers or folks who are using the beaches for other activities or folks that are just generally really concerned about shark populations in general. Okay, so if we're going to take any regulatory measures, the first thing we have to do is define what shore-based shark fishing is. And I know that sounds silly, because anytime you ask somebody, they say, when you see a shore-based shark fisherman, you know it. Um, so yes, we would probably define it as fishing or harvesting sharks from shore or from a structure attached to shore, such as, such as piers, jetties, bridges, docks, etc. cetera. Um, but we could potentially go farther to provide some more specific information about who is impacted by any regulations we put in place for shore-based shark, shore shark fishing. Our primary goal when we try to divide this fishery would be to accurately capture what is shark fishing 
without inadvertently sweeping up other activities in the, in the process. So we wouldn't want to inadvertently include uh, shore-based anglers who are targeting other species um, in the regulations that are really intended to address the, the shark fishery. So that's what this potential gear-based definition is about. Um, and I would love to hear your feedback on this. We could potentially say that angler, anglers using any of these certain gears or other things that you might have to suggest or techniques, um, that they would automatically be defined as a shore-based shark fisherman, even if they were targeting another species. Um, one, that would give us um, the public, the fishermen, law enforcement, everybody would know when they walk up. Um, the fishermen would know if I'm going fishing with this gear today, I'm considered a shore-based shark fisherman and I need to abide by the proper regulations. Um, that would obviously capture the shark fishermen. Um, if you are targeting some other species using this type of gear, you'd probably be more likely to encounter sharks anyway. Um, and so there would be value in, in defining what this fishery looks like. So some of the characteristics we could include um, would be steel leaders, um, maybe four feet or longer or three feet or longer. Um, we'd love to hear from feedback from that. Um, we do know that the shark fishery sometimes uses uh, longer steel leaders than other fisheries. High capacity reels, maybe it's a 50 pound class or greater. Um, anybody fishing from shore with a fighting belt or a harness or anyone deploying baits by means other than casting, like kayaks, jet skis, surfboards. Um, essentially, people could uh, drop their baits with drones. If you're bold enough to swim out your bait, then good for you. Um, I'm not. Uh, so, uh, but so these are some ideas of characteristics we could use to define this fishery so that everybody would know who the regulations apply to. All right, so now I'm going to go through a series of options that we've identified um, that we're looking for your feedback on. Um, and we can do all of these, none of these, some combination. So the first would be to require an FWC issued permit to participate in the shore based shark fishery. If we do require a permit, it will be no cost. Um, and it could be applied, it could be required of individuals fishing for sharks from shore, or we could potentially have a permit that is for um, folks operating shore based shark fishing tournaments. So if you have an opinion about which of those, um, or both or neither, we would love to hear that. Uh, we could also include an educational component. This is one of the things we've heard from a lot of people, both within the fishery and outside the fishery, that they'd like to see, um, whether it's a shark ID course or handling courses, um, information that you would be required to take as an educational course probably online um, before you would be issued your permit. And our primary goal, if we went with a permit requirement, would be to identify who's participating in this fishery so that we could reach out to those folks with outreach information, make sure they know what the regulations are, um, and the other the, kind of the bonus for that is if we did at some point want to do research on who's participating, you know, what the effort level is, what they're targeting, we would know who's participating in this fishery and we would have that platform to conduct surveys of folks that are participating in the fishery. So the next option would be to limit or prohibit chumming from shore. I will tell you that every shore based shark fisherman I've ever talked to says, Nobody chumps from shore. Um, so there you go. Uh, but we do have a lot of folks in the public who either have witnessed it or think that they've witnessed it or have concerns about the activity of chumming from shore if they're doing, uh, if they're swimming or, or on the beach. Um, so we could consider some sort of provision here. Again, that would require definition. Um, we wouldn't want the definition to capture other activities um, that are not necessarily chumming. Chumming is one of those things that when you know it, you see it, but we need to be able to define it. Um, so we probably want to avoid prohibiting things um, like throwing unused bait back in the water at the end of the day or, or other activities that might not necessarily be chumming. Uh, so we have a, a potential definition here for you to think about. And that would be placing fish parts or other animal products in the water for the purpose of attract attracting fish. Um, we would exclude bait attached to a hook and line or in a trap. Um, but we could possibly also um, have an exemption for fishing gears. So if you fish from a pier, for something other than sharks, we would love to hear if you think that we need to exempt fishing piers uh, from a prohibition on chumming. Um, we know that folks targeting sheep's head will scrape barnacles. Uh, we have had people tell me that they chum up bait when they're fishing from a fishing pier, um, snapper, other species. So um, that's another thing to think about. If we prohibit chumming, do we need to create an exemption for fishing piers? And this would be, um, this type of an action would be intended to alleviate those concerns from the, the public about safety associated with the fishery. So a couple more options that we can consider. Um, one would be to physically separate the different activities um, of the user groups, including shore-based shark fishermen. 
Uh, we could limit shore bay shark fishing to nighttime hours, uh, which is when most other beach goers are not on the beach. So that is an option that we can consider. Um, we could also prohibit shore bay shark fishing from specific coastal areas. This is something that we've heard uh, from folks who are concerned about public safety. Um, it could be a public bathing beach. We would want to define that better um, if we were going to do that. Or prohibit shore bay shark fishing from a beach when there's, when there's a lifeguard present because that's when folks are most like, the places that people are more likely to, to aggregate and, and participate in other activities. And again, if we did anything in this direction, it would be to alleviate that conflict and perceived safety concerns from folks who are not participating in the fishery. We could also potentially um, create some limitations on the shore based shark fishing tournaments. If we wanted to do that, we could consider not, not allowing these tournaments to have categories for prohibited species, so things like the hammerheads, tigers, lemon sharks. Um, if it, we didn't want to go so far as to prohibit categories, we could prohibit um, awards for them or even just prohibit link-based awards so that folks aren't encouraged to measure those prohibited species and keep them out of the water longer. Uh, if we did something with the tournaments, would, the intention would be to alleviate concerns about targeting these prohibited species and potential for increased release mortality associated with those activities. And then the last option that I'm going to bring to you, you're certainly welcome to provide feedback on, on, on or some other ideas. The last option that we're bringing forward is some gear or handling requirements that could be required for this fishery. I will say um, these could be required for the shore-based shark fishery. We could also consider these for shark fishing in general. So if folks are, if you shark fish from a vessel, um, think about that too when you're providing feedback from here. Um, here. Um, we could require specific gear when fishing for sharks. That could be long-handled de hookers or, or long-handled cutter, long cutters. Uh, we've heard folks recommend barbless hooks for this fishery um, and also non-stainless steel circle hooks. I will tell you that if you're fishing in federal waters for sharks, you are already required to use uh, circle hooks. That's something that we could consider uh, implementing in state waters as well and then we would have that similar regulation for both, both parts of uh, the sharks areas where folks fish. We could also consider some additional requirements specifically for those prohibited species that I talked about. Uh, we could require that the sharks remain in the water. We could prohibit measuring prohibited species. That's not currently prohibited. Um, or we could very explicitly prohibit <coughs> delaying release for any reason other than taking out the hook or cutting the leader. And anything that we did on this front would be to try and get at maximizing the survival of those release sharks. All right, so this is kind of an overview of all the things that I brought forward. You'll notice that the last two are status quo. If you feel like we don't need any changes, we certainly welcome that feedback. If you have other ideas that I didn't uh, bring forward in the presentation, we would love your feedback on that as well. Um, but this is just a summary of all the other issues that we already talked about, and I'm not going to.